The Poem of Man God. Volume 1, Chapter 7. The sun has put his wisdom on his mother's lips. 29th of August, 1944. I see Anne once again. Since yesterday evening, I see her thus, sitting at the entrance of the shady pergola, busy at her needlework. She is wearing a grey sand-coloured dress, a very simple one and very wide, probably because of the great heat. At the end of the pergola, the mowers can be seen cutting the hay. But it cannot be first crop hay because the grapes are almost golden-coloured and the fruits of a large apple tree are like shiny yellow and red wax. The cornfield is nothing but stubble with poppies, waving like tiny flames, and the stiff and clear cornflowers shaped like stars, and as blue as the eastern sky. A little Mary comes forward from the shady pergola. She is already quick and independent. Her short step is steady, and her white sandals do not stumble amongst the pebbles. Her graceful gait already resembles the slightly undulating step of a dove, and she is all white, like a little dove, in her linen dress which stretches down to her ankles. It is a wide dress, curled at the neck by a blue ribbon, and the short sleeves show rosy and plump forearms. She looks like a little angel, her hair is silky and honey-blonde, not very curly, but gracefully wavy, ending in curls. Her eyes are sky-blue, her sweet little face is rosy and smiling. Also, the breeze that through her wide sleeves inflate the shoulders of her linen dress helps to give her the appearance of a little angel, having his wings half open, ready to fly. She has in her hands poppies, cornflowers, and other flowers that grow in cornfields. But I do not know their names. She's walking, and when she's near her mother, she starts running, shouting joyfully, and like a little dove, she ends her flight against her mother's knees. She has opened them to receive her. Anne has put her needlework aside so that she would not get pricked, and has opened her arms to embrace her. So far yesterday evening, this morning she reappears and continues as follows. Mummy, mummy! The little white dove is completely in the nest of her mother's knees, touching the short grass with her little feet and hiding her face in her mother's lap, so that only her golden hair can be seen on the nape of her neck, over which Anne bends to kiss it fondly. Then she lifts her head and offers her mother flowers. They are all for her mummy, and of each one she tells the story she has invented. This blue and big one is a star which has come down from heaven to bring the kiss of the Lord to my mummy. Here, kiss this little celestial flower there on its heart, and you will see that it tastes of God. This other one, instead, which is a paler blue, like Daddy's eyes, has written on its leaves that Lord loves Daddy very much because he is good. And this tiny little one, the only one to be found, it is a myosote, is the one that God made to tell Mary that he loves her. And these red ones, does Mummy know what they are? They are pieces of King David's dress, stained with the blood of the enemies of Israel, and sown on the battlefields and the fields of victory. They originate from those strips of the heroic regal dress torn in the struggle for the Lord. Instead, this white and gentle one, that seems to be made with seven silk cups looking up to the sky, full of perfumes, that was growing over there, near the spring, Daddy picked it for her amongst the thorns, is made with the dress of Solomon. He wore it so many, many years before, in the same month in which his little granddaughter was born. And he walked in the midst of the multitudes of Israel before the ark and the tabernacle, in the splendid majesty of his robes. And he rejoiced 
because of the cloud which returned to encircle his glory and he sang the canticle and the prayer of his joy. I want to be always like this flower and like the wise king, I want to sing throughout my life canticles and prayers before the tabernacle, ends Mary. How do you know these holy things, my darling? Who told you? Your father? No, I do not know who it is. I think I have always known them. Perhaps there is one who tells me and I do not see him. Perhaps one of the angels that God sends to speak to good people. Mummy, will you tell me another story? Oh, my dear, which story do you wish to know? Mary is thinking, deeply absorbed in her thoughts. Her expression should be immortalised in a portrait. The shadows of her thoughts are reflected on her childish face. There are smiles and sighs, sunshine and clouds, thinking of the history of Israel. Then she makes up her mind. Once again, the story of Gabriel and Daniel, where Christ is promised. And she listens with her eyes closed, repeating in a low voice the words her mother says, as if to remember them better. When Anne comes to the end, she asks, How long will it be before we have the Emmanuel? About thirty years, darling. Such a long time, and I shall be in the temple. Tell me, if I should pray very hard, so hard, day and night, night and day, and I want to belong only to God for all my life, for this purpose, would the Eternal Father grant me the grace of sending the Messiah to his people sooner? I do not know, my dear. The prophet states seventy weeks. I do not think a prophecy can be wrong. But the Lord is so good, she hastens to add, seeing tears appear on the fair eyelashes of a child. The Lord is so good that I believe that if you do pray very hard, so hard he will hear your prayer. A smile appears once again on her little face, which she has lifted up towards her mother, and the rays of the sun, filtering through the fine branches, cause her tears to shine like dewdrops on very thin stems of alpine moss. Then I will pray, and I shall be a virgin for this. But do you know what that means? It means that one does not know human love, but only the love of God. It means that one has no other thought but for the Lord. It means to remain children in the flesh and angels in the heart. It means that one has no eyes but to look at God and ears to listen to him, and a mouth to praise him, hands to offer oneself as a victim, feet to follow him fast, and a heart and a life to be given to him. May God bless you, but then you will never have any children, and yet you love babies and little lambs and doves so much. Do you know that? A baby is for his mother like a little white and curly lamb. He's like a little dove with silk feathers and coral mouth to be loved and kissed and heard say, Mummy. It does not matter. I shall belong to God. I shall pray in the temple. And perhaps one day I will see the Emmanuel. The virgin who is to be his mother must be already born as the great prophet says, and she is in the temple. I will be her companion and maidservant. Oh, yes, if I could only meet her, by God's light, I would like to serve her, the Blessed One. And later she would bring me to her son. She would take me to her son, and I would serve him too. Just think, Mummy, to serve the Messiah. Mary is overcome by this thought that exalts her and makes her totally humble at the same time. With her hands crossed over her breast, 
and her little head slightly bent forward and flushed with emotion. She's like an infantile reproduction of the Annunciation that I saw. She resumes. But will the King of Israel, the Lord's anointed, allow me to serve him? Have no doubt about that. Does King Solomon not say? There are sixty queens and eighty concubines and countless maidens. You can see that in the king's palace. There will be countless maidens serving the Lord. Oh, you can see that I must be a virgin, I must. If he wants a virgin as his mother, it means that he loves virginity above all things. I want him to love me, his maiden, because of the virginity which will make me somewhat like his beloved mother. This is what I want. I would also like to be a sinner, a big sinner. If I were not afraid of offending the Lord, tell me, mummy, can one be a sinner out of love of God? But what are you saying, my dear? I, I don't understand you. I mean, to commit a sin in order to be loved by God, who becomes the saviour. Who is lost is saved, isn't that so? I would like to be saved by the saviour, to receive his loving look. That is why I would like to sin, but not to commit a sin that would disgust him. How can he save me if I do not get lost? Anne is dumbfounded. She does not know what to say. Joachim helps her. He has approached them, walking noiselessly on the grass behind the low hedge of fine shoots. He has saved you beforehand because he knows that you love him and you want to love him only. So you are already redeemed and you can be a virgin as you wish, says Joachim. Is that true, Daddy? Mary embraces his knees and looks at him with her clear blue eyes, so like her father's and so happy because of this hope she gets from her father. It is true, my darling. Look, I was just bringing you this little sparrow that at its first flight landed near the spring. I could have left it there, but its weak wings did not have enough strength to fly off again, and its tiny legs could not hold it onto the slippery moss stones. It would have fallen into the water, but I did not wait for that. I took it, and now I am giving it to you. You will do what you like with it. The fact is that it was saved before it fell into danger. God has done the same thing with you. Now tell me, Mary, have I loved the sparrow more by saving it beforehand? Or would I have loved it more, saving it afterwards? You have loved it now because you did not let it get hurt in the cold water. And God has loved you more, because he has loved you before you sinned. And I will love him wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. My beautiful little sparrow, I am like you. The Lord has loved us both equally by saving us. I will now rear you, and then I will let you go. And you in the forest and I in the temple will sing the praises of God. And we shall say, please send the one you promised to those who expect him. Oh, Daddy, when are you taking me to the temple? Soon, my dear. But are you not sorry to leave your father? Yes, very much. But you will come. In any case, if it did not hurt, what sacrifice would it be? And you will remember us? I always will. After the prayer for the Emmanuel, I will pray for you, that God may give you joy and a long life, until the day he becomes the Saviour. Then I will ask him to take you to the celestial Jerusalem. The vision ends with Mary tightly clasped in her father's arms. Jesus says, 
I can already hear the comments of the doctors with captious objections. How can a little girl, not yet three years old, speak thus? It is an exaggeration. And they do not consider that they make a monster of me by ascribing adults' actions to my own childhood. Intelligence is not given to everybody in the same way and at the same time. The Church has fixed the age of reason at six years of age, because that is the age when even a backward child can tell good from evil, at least in basically important matters. But there are children who long before that age are capable of discerning and understanding and wanting with sufficiently developed discretion. Little Imelda Lambertini, Rosa da Viterbo, Nelly Organ, Nenolina may give you confirmation, O oh difficult doctors, to believe that my mother was able to think and speak like that. I have quoted four names at random amongst the thousands of holy children who populate my paradise. After reasoning as adults, for possibly more or fewer years. What is reason? A gift of God. God can therefore give it as he wishes, to whom he wishes and when he wishes. Reason, in fact, is one of the things that makes you more like God. The Intelligent and Reasoning Spirit Reason and intelligence were graces given to God, to man, in the earthly paradise. How full of life they were when grace was alive, still intact and active in the spirit of the first two parents. In the book of Jesus ben Sirach, it is stated, All wisdom is from the Lord, and it is his own forever. What wisdom, therefore, would men have had, had they remained children of God? The gaps in your intelligence are the natural fruits of your fall from grace and honesty. By losing grace, you banished wisdom for centuries. As a meteor which is hidden behind masses of clouds, wisdom no longer reaches you with its bright flashes, but through mist which your prevarications have rendered thicker and thicker. Then Christ came and he restored grace, the supreme gift of the love of God. But do you know how to keep this gem clear and pure? No, you don't. When you do not crush it with your individual will in sinning, you soil it with your continuous minor faults, your weaknesses, your attachment to vice. Such attempts, even if they are not a proper marriage, with the septiform vice, are a weakening of the light of grace and of its activity. And then, to weaken the magnificent light of intelligence that God had given the first parents, you have centuries and centuries of corruption, which exert a harmful influence on the body and on the mind. But Mary was not only the pure, the new Eve created for the joy of God. She was the super Eve, the masterpiece of the Most High. She was the full of grace, the mother of the word in the mind of God. Jesus ben Sirach saith, Source of wisdom is the word. Will the Son, therefore, not have put his wisdom on his mother's lips? If the mouth of a prophet was purified with embers, because he had to repeat to men the words that the word, the wisdom, entrusted to him, will love not have cleansed and exalted the speech of his infant spouse, who was to bear the word, so that she should no longer speak as a little girl, and then as a woman, but only and always, as a celestial creature, melted in the great light and wisdom of God. 
The miracle is not in the superior intelligence shown by Mary in her childhood, as afterwards it was by me. The miracle is in containing the infinite intelligence that dwelt there, within suitable bounds, so that crowds should not be startled and satanic attention should not be awakened. I will talk again on this subject, which is part of the remembrance which saints have of God.